Dan, welcome. We're excited to have you here and talk about your new book, To Sell as Human. Many, many fascinating ideas in it. Could you start off by, by talking to us a little bit about why are we all in sales? Yeah, well, there are a couple animating ideas in, in the book, Adam. One of them is, is that, like it or not, we're all in sales. Uh, if you look at the labor data, one in nine people in the economy today, one in nine workers, makes a living selling stuff. They're car dealers, real estate agents. But I, I had an instinct about those other eight and nine, and went out and did some survey research and found that those other eight and nine, these are people who are not nominally in sales. They are managers. They are project team leaders. They are teachers and art directors. That they're spending an enormous amount of their time in what I call non-sales selling. They're, they're, they're selling. They're convincing you to make an exchange. Give me something you have in exchange for something that I have. But it's denominated not in dollars. It's denominated in time. It's denominated in, in attention. It's denominated in effort. And so I think if you look at how white collar workers are spending their time, whether they're in traditional sales or some other kind of function, a lot of their time and effort is spent convincing, persuading, cajoling, influencing people. And the truth is, is that when you tell everybody, you, you tell people you're in sales, a lot of people don't like it very much at all. I don't want to be in sales. No, no one so does. I mean, why am I in it? Well, well, well. The re well, I think what's interesting is that why people don't want to be in there because they have this association that sales is sleazy, slimy, smarmy, lowbrow, low rent. It's about hoodwinkery and sleazebaggery and all those kind of other great words that we use to describe it. You know, something is awesome when there's so many different synonyms to describe how duplicitous it is. And my view is that that's a very outdated form of sales in all its dimension. That that is a view, the view that sales is slimy, smarmy, sleazy, duplicitous, is a view to me about the conditions in which sales have taken place for a long time, rather than the nature of sales itself. Um, and what I mean by that is that most of what we know about sales sales, car sales, real estate sales, uh, whatever, uh, come from a world of information asymmetry, where the seller always has more information than the buyer. When the seller has more information than the buyer, the seller can rip you off, period. This is why we have the whole principle of caveat emptor, buyer beware. But now, more and more, and not everywhere, but in a lot of markets, that information asymmetry is becoming more like information parity. And you see this in, a, you see this in sales sales, business to consumer sales, where people walk into a car dealer armed with information that in some cases not even the car dealer him or herself had 20 years ago. You also see it in B2B sales where you talk to basically anybody in B2B sales and what, they're what they'll tell you is that they are the customer, the prospect is engaging in the sales process far, far, far later in the game because they're able to do their own due diligence, their own information gathering and they have a set of ideas, a set of options in mind when they engage the, the, the salesperson. So the animating ideas here are like it or not, we're all in sales now, but sales isn't what it used to be. And so if sales is more about the high road, not everywhere, but it's more about the high road, I said, well, what are the qualities that, that matter most? And there I plumbed the research of social scientists like you and your colleagues all over the world to try to say, you know, let's not go based on books about um, 18 ways to close the deal <laughs> or, you know, the, the kind of books that populate the sales shelves. Let's look a little bit at what social scientists have told us about what's effective here. So what is effective? If, I, granted, I, I guess I am in sales, and we all are. <laughs> uh, if I want to get better at it, what are some of your, your favorite well, tips? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, here's the thing. I think that educators are in sales. Uh, uh, that essentially, what you're doing is you're, at some level, making an exchange with your class. You're saying, give me your attention. In exchange, I'll give you something else. And now, it's not, you know, the cash register is not ringing. It's not denominated in dollars or cents or, or euros, but it is a form of sales, in a way. It is an exchange. Uh, I think that, that managers and organizations absolutely are doing this. And if you look at some of the data that we have, we, we, we have a kind of a, a we had a, uh, asked a question of how much time people are spending doing this sort of stuff. We had a mean of 40%. Um, but at some level, it masked what was, else was going on because we had a lot of people up on the upper registers, 70, 80 percent. And I think a lot of them were managers. What are they doing? They're trying to convince someone to join their team. They're trying to get a current uh, employee to do things a little bit differently or to do something else that's a little bit different. They are dealing with their own bosses and trying to persuade them. And so managers, leaders inside of organizations are spending huge amounts of time doing this. And I think the way to do it better, the way to do it better in all senses of the word, more effectively and more ethically, is what I call the new ABCs. Attunement, buoyancy, and clarity. Attunement, buoyancy, and clarity. A, attunement, perspective taking. How do you understand someone else's perspective? Um, B, buoyancy. 
salespeople in general, one of my favorite characters in this book was a guy named Norman Hall, who's sold Fuller Brushes, sells Fuller Brushes, last Fuller Brush man in San Francisco. And he said, I love this phrase. He said, when you're in sales, every day you face, this is his phrase, an ocean of rejection. So buoyancy is how do you remain buoyant on an ocean of rejection? What do you do before? What do you do during? What do you do after? And then clarity is, um, I think this is really important for leaders and even business school students. First of all, we got a lot of information, so accessing information doesn't give you much of an advantage. What matters more is being able to curate the information, filter the information, make sense of it, detect patterns in, this, in the information. The second thing, and not only through data analytics and things like that, but just being able to sort of synthesize the information on your own. The second thing is I think there's a premium now on, premium has moved from problem solving as a skill to problem finding. That if a customer or prospect knows precisely what their problem is, if I can articulate, identify exactly what my problem is, I can probably find a solution. But you're more useful if I don't know what my problem is or if I'm wrong about my problem. And so this move from problem solving to problem finding is clarity. So these are the new ABCs, and there's some really interesting ways that I think managers, leaders, and organizations can get a lot better at them. So if I think about these ABCs, at least the A and the C, it almost sounds like selling is, is a little bit more about advising or consulting than it is sort of influencing, pushing, persuading. Is that, is that fair? I think it's a very, very fair comment. And that's, in fact, one reason why I wanted to draw the, I mean, one reason I wanted to draw the contrast. ABC comes from always be closing, which is the pushing steamroller, drive, drive, drive. And what I wanted to try to do is, is, is in some ways, take that on. And I, one of the things that you see out there in sales sales is a move from, even from selling solutions, which was an idea that's been around for a while, to selling insights. One of my favorite examples is, um, is uh, Perfetti Von Melli, the, the, confe the candy company. They, say, they make Mentos. Okay, I, I happen to love Mentos. And what they did is they, they, their sales force is going into mom and pop shops, convenience stores, bodegas, selling Mentos. And they made a transition in their sales process and the way that they trained their salespeople and the way that their salespeople did their work. They felt that they had a lot of data about candy of all sorts. They were able to take that data with the, each store's data put it together. So they come in on a sales call and they say to that mom and pop shop, we've looked at your data, we've looked at our data, here's our recommendations for the, uh, the, the sweet S-U-I-T-E suite of, <laughs> of products that, you're, that you should be selling. And in some cases, it'll mean selling, we're only going to recommend five kinds of Mentos for your store instead of seven, even though in the short term, seven is a better deal for us. In some cases, we're going to recommend our competitors' products, which is you know heresy in the world of sales. And so they say we're you know we're not only selling we're selling Mentos, but we're really selling insights about the confections business. And as a result of that, to your point about advising, this is a, this is a, a these are salespeople who are actually welcomed when they arrive because they're 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 offering insights. They're not simply trying to push more candy on your on your store shelves. Um, and in the long run, I think today that's much more effective. That's an incredibly interesting example. And I guess one of the questions it raises for me touches on one of the skills you talk about in the book, which is pitching. Yeah. So it's easy to pitch a product. How do you pitch an insight? Oh, interesting. Um, well I think the, the the insight in that case would be um, let's think about an example. Um, for, for some reason, um, this is an area that isn't um, that predisposed to mints, mint flavors, or something like that. Or there's a new emerging kind of um, more natural kind of product that's, that's actually perking up in areas like yours, and you can pitch basically that. So it's an insight. It ultimately is an insight about a product. It's an insight about how to run your business. But at the heart of it, especially in the confections business, it's about what um, group of products you actually offer. Great. And let's come back then to the B and the ABC, so buoyancy. So we, we all face a lot of rejection as we try Absolutely. to achieve our goals. Absolutely. What are some of the most effective strategies you've uncovered for maintaining that ability well, to Well, one of, them, one of my favorites, because it's so counterintuitive, uh, comes from some work by some folks at, at Illinois, actually one of them now here at Wharton um, and Mississippi State, about self-talk. Um, and the conventional view on self-talk is that we should pump ourselves up. We're going into a sales call. You can do it. You got this. You're an ant. You know, even some of the hyper masculine sort of you're an animal, you're a monster, that kind of stuff. Um, and what this research found is that you're better off uh, deploying what they call interrogative self talk, um, not saying I can do it, but asking yourself, can you do this? And 
it seems weird. It seems, you know, like Stuart Smalley and Tony Robbins would start, you know, going crazy over this. But when you unpack it, it actually makes a lot of sense. If I go into an encounter, um, let's, say, let's, say I'm, let's say I'm pitching ideas for a new book, or let's say that I'm pitching ideas to, let's say I'm pitching ideas for a new book. Um, if I go into that pitch meeting ahead of time and say, Dan, you can do this, right? That's sort of affirmative, declarative, pumping up. I, I feel pretty good about that. I mean, I, I do. I like hearing that I'm awesome. I like telling myself. I mean, <laughs> it's fine. I mean, there is, a, there is. I mean, again, I don't know the research on this particular thing, but there is at least in our human experience a kind of sort of a certain level of at least momentary buoyancy in that a- affirmation. We feel good. But if I say instead, can you do this? Questions are active. And that's the whole point. The questions require, even in self-talk, questions elicit active response. So if I say, can you do this? I say, well, yeah, I can do this. I've pitched books before. Can you do this? Um, yeah, I can do this because um, this is a really great. This is a really great idea, and I've researched it really well. And I and I can just. I'm very confident in the contours of this idea. Can I do this? You know, every time I pitch a book, Maria over there, she doesn't like it. Okay, she's she's just a total naysayer. And but what I've done is I've done some research and figured out what really lights Maria's. Uh, uh, porch light, and I will make sure. We've got to make sure that I mention that to get Maria. So what am I doing there? I'm preparing. It's a so so this thing that's sort of nominally kind of I mean, it has a kind of fake muscularity to it. This you can do it. You got this. But the real muscularity is in asking yourself the question and actively responding because then you actually begin to rehearse, you begin to prepare, you begin to summon your reasons for doing it, and it ends up being far more effective. And what I like about that is that anybody can do it. I mean, it doesn't cost you any extra money. It just is a matter of changing your self-talk from affirmative and declarative to interrogative. So I think this is one of the most powerful themes in the book is the idea of questions. Yeah. So you've talked to us about, about questions that you would direct yeah. toward yourself. Yeah. How do questions play into then moving other people? There are there are a number of different there are a number of different ways about there are a number of different ways about that. One of my um, one of the interesting techniques, again at the level of at the level of tactics, it, it goes in some ways to clarity is some of the work in the therapeutic technique of motivational interviewing. So let's say that um, um, I mean, I think this works in all realms of our life. So let's say that uh, I've got uh, I've got three kids. I got a 14 year old daughter, uh, 16 year old daughter. Neither one of them ever cleans their room. Okay, the rooms are just total pigsties. Um, and so for a long time, you know, I, you know, my my strategy was just to close the door. Okay, <laughs> so. But, you know, again, it ends up actually affecting me because someone can't find something and, hey, Dad, where's the baby? Okay, so, so let's say I want to convince my 14-year-old daughter, Eliza, to clean her room. Now, I could try the parental command and control approach. You've got to clean your room. I could try the carrot and stick approach. I'll give you 10 bucks to clean your room. That's not going to work. I mean, it might get some nominal cleaning in the short term, but it's not sustained behavior. I could do a, a, um, uh, a, a stick approach. You're gonna, I'm going to issue some punishment. But those kinds of things don't have any enduring effect. And so what this motivational interviewing technique suggests us to do is this. I say to my daughter, Eliza, Eliza, on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 meaning not ready at all, 10 meaning totally ready to do this, on a scale of 1 to 10, how ready are you to clean up this mess of a room? Now, so let's say that she says, she's obviously not that ready to do it because it's still messy. So let's say she says a 3 on a scale of 10. Right. This, this is where it gets interesting. I say, oh, three. Okay, great. Why isn't it lower? And this is the really key point here in this therapeutic technique. Why isn't it lower? Okay, first of all, the question is a surprise because the, the, the standard expectation is three. What do you mean? It should be a nine. <laughs> this is really important. A three. Okay, why isn't it lower? Why isn't it a two? And so what she, did, she begins summoning her own reasons for doing something. She's, well, sometimes hard to find stuff. Sometimes you and mom aren't around, so if I lose something, I can't find it. You know, um, it actually feels a little bit better when my room is a little bit clean. And so what she does is that the question, um, again, because it's active, it's, 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 it's active and autonomous. So she has to respond actively, but she also summons her own autonomous, intrinsically motivated reasons for, for doing something. And, and that's generally a better path to sustained behavior. I, I love the example. Um, I guess I'm wondering what happens when you repeat it and yeah. she learns and says yeah. one. 
Yeah, yeah. No, here's the thing. On that one, I think you have to deploy it very carefully. You don't do it on everything. It's like, okay, uh, okay, guys, we're having dinner now. Um, uh, somebody needs to set the table. I don't want to set the table. On a scale of one to ten, how ready? <laughs> no, I think you have to deploy it. I think you have to deploy it sparingly and for things that actually for things that actually matter. Um, but uh, but again, it goes back to this book Drive that I wrote, where this, where one of the great social psychologists of our of our age, Edward Deasy, says you know repeatedly he says we have to think about motivation not as something one person does to another, but as something people do for themselves. And what you can do is you and I think questions have that kind of power. They they're not directive. They they're they're active. They're engaging. And if people respond to it, they come up with their own reasons. And the, you know, the truth is, if we have our own reasons for doing something, reasons that we endorse, we're more likely to do it, we're more likely to stick with it. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess one thing I'm curious about on that is if you think about sort of the more slick and manipulative types of salespeople yeah. that you're, you're debunking in this book, yeah. um, can, they, can they use this for evil in, in the sense of you know, leading the witness? I think that's possible. I mean, I think that's possible to use some of these tactics for, for evil. For instance, you could have a... Um, 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 I mean, evil is a strong word, but for, so for, for, for not good things rather than for, for good things. For instance, there's some interesting research showing that uh, when we hear rhymes, things that rhyme, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Or the great study showing that people tend to think, if you take the aphorism, woes unite foes versus woes unite enemies. Same, su- and substantively, we can, I mean, the linguists can argue whether, no, they mean slightly different things, but let's just say, stipulate that substantively it means pretty much the same thing. You give those two statements to people and they'll say woes unite foes is a much more accurate description of human character, much more true principle about life. And the reason is, is that rhymes increase processing fluency. And so it's possible to use a rhyme. I'm sure it's been, there are histories where a rhyming pitch could be used for um, evil ends or nefarious ends. Same thing is true with, um, it's an interesting question. I bet sort of certain um, kind of far right, far left fascist or extreme totalitarian folks have probably used questions as a way to summon people's responses. Mm-hmm. So I guess then if, if we can sort of take this uh, toward your own application of these principles, yeah. I, I know your identity has evolved a little bit as you worked on the book to see yourself as a salesman. Yeah, well, that's true, yeah. <laughs> so what, what implications has that had for how you do your own daily work? Uh, it's actually had a lot, and, and, and probably more than any other book that I've that, I, that I've written. I found myself in the research and the reporting of this book saying, "Whoa, wait a second! I could actually so on so many different dimensions." One of them is I real. I mean, it's a, I, I don't want to say it's late in the game, but but I, I realized that I wasn't very adept at listening. And I'm sorry, what were you saying? <laughs> I wasn't adept at listening. And one of the things that I've tried to do is be, at some level, is just simply to wait, not to jump right in when people say something or so, so to make sure that I actually hear it, to concentrate a little bit more on, on listening as a form of attunement. Um, the other thing, I was very taken by the research on, some of the research on perspective taking as, as something different from empathy. That is not simply understanding people's feelings, but understanding what they're thinking and what their interests are. And I found myself in certain kinds of conflicts and negotiations really stopping and saying, literally saying, what are these persons' interests? What are, what are they thinking? I mean, I want to be emotionally intelligent about it all. I want to have empathy, see where they're coming from. And that's more effective than doing nothing. But I, I, I think the muscularity of, of, of perspective taking as a kind of cognitive skill has been very useful to me. Um, uh, the, the, I mean, truly, the interrogative self-talk has been, the interrogative self-talk has been useful to me in preparing myself for things, and even the, um, even the, you know, some of the, the, the information about, about, about pitches. So, th- so there's some interesting research out of Carnegie Mellon about how to you draft an email subject line, and that has been really useful to me. I realized how bad my email subject lines were. They were too, they were too mushy. Um, and so this helped me clarify that. So there are a lot of things really at the tactical level that have made me say, hey, you know what? I can get a little bit, a little bit better at all this stuff. Very good. Well, Dan, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And uh, we look forward to continuing to dive into To Sell as Human, The Surprising Truth About Moving Others. All right.